All right. Does uh, anybody who hasn't asked a question yet want to ask one? We get some new hands in the air. Since it's almost lunchtime, can we talk diet? <laughs> mm, okay, we can talk diet. Um, and could you touch on fluoride in the pineal gland? Um, <coughs> I've been reading a little bit about how it calcifies, and that's the pineal gland is the gateway to the soul or the spirit. Or um, can you touch on that? Yeah. Well, uh, there's a couple of things about that that's maybe worth talking about. One, remember the pineal gland is a virtual pineal gland. Okay, it's the body, the physical body is really not the gateway to anything. Okay, the physical body is, is um, information. Now, that doesn't mean that the physical body isn't important to us because it limits the information that we can get. So even though the brain doesn't store any information, the virtual brain that evolved, you know, in the virtual Big Bang sets the limitations on what this virtual brain can do. So the consciousness that's in this game can't do, think, or, you know, accomplish physically anything that the, that the simulation of the body, that, that evolved thing, can do. So it's the consciousness that stores information and that processes information, not the virtual brain. But the virtual brain sets the limitations. You can't do anything that consciousness can't think or process any information that that virtual brain of his avatar, if you will, his character, couldn't do. So if you hit somebody over the head with an iron pipe and give them brain damage, now they have more constraints on what that consciousness can experience and do. Okay, or if they have dementia, there's more constraints on that consciousness. It doesn't mean that their consciousness is demented or somehow deformed or something. It's just that the constraints go up. In a virtual reality, the characters can only do what the rule set allows them to do. They can't do other things. You can't take your, your elf in the world of Warcraft and have him take one finger and touch you know, all the fingernails on his other hand. That's easy to do, right? But you can't do it because that wasn't programmed in the rule set to allow them to do that, so it's not something that they can do. You can only do what's in the rule set. Now, of course, our rule set wasn't programmed. It evolved. There's, there's a difference. Programming is, of course, a very crude and limited process. When it evolves, then you get all this natural detail because it builds upon itself. You know, it's like a fractal process that builds upon itself. Pursuing it gets huge and immense, but it's all evolved to be that way. So we have the pineal gland, and the pineal gland is, is at the center of the brain, somewhere, I guess, just behind the frontal lobes, whatever, and that has a, a lot to do in the evolved system about how the brain works. Okay, it produces neurotransmitters. You can't think, you can't process without that, that gland. Now again, we're starting to sound like it's physical, right? But it's still just data. It's the way the system, it's part of the rule set. That's the way the rule set has evolved. So it is important in that sense. And things that you can do are then important. Just like you hit the brain with an iron pipe, then you've more constraints. If you were to go in and, and take out the pineal gland by surgery or something, now you've changed and put on more constraints to a person Fluoride because they're- constraint? If, um yeah, you, you, now that consciousness can't function except within the rule set. And if you have a brain without a pineal gland, then it can function differently. Or if you have a brain that's been with a lobotomy, that the two halves have been you know, separated, then you have certain constraints are applied to that system that the consciousness can't, can't function. It has to function within the constraints. Okay, so first of all, that's kind of the dichotomy between the virtual and the, and the physical. Now. Another aspect is that you can modify the physical with your intent. Okay? Now your intent can modify your brain. As you grow up, as you increase the quality of your consciousness, your reality expands, your awareness expands, your ability to understand things expands, and guess what? Your brain changes to mirror that growth. Okay? So the mind 
leads and the brain follows and the body follows. So as you grow up, your physical system actually modifies itself to be able to support the functions that you've learned. So your body is also flexible in the sense that you can, you can modify it with intent. So these are all kind of issues. Now, whether or not fluoride you know, has a particular effect on, the, on that gland or not, that should just be a matter of, of science. But you have all these conflicting results, right? Good science is often difficult to come by in things like that because the measurement of how it's affected tends to be very subjective. So you end up with, it's difficult to do good science. Now they could do things very dramatic like remove a pineal gland, right, and see what the difference is. See what restrictions. So that's pretty dramatic and nobody would kind of argue with that result. But when it comes to does fluoride do it, does this do it, does some of the things do it, I'd say that generally it's very squishy science and I would advise be open-minded but be skeptical because you have a lot of variables. One of the variables is the intent. One of the variables is that pineal gland can be modified by the nature of the being itself. So all these variables, it's hard to come up with hard and fast rules about things that affect, have, make subtle effects. I would say if it concerns you and you think it might be a problem, then you know, take measures accordingly. If you think not, then forget about it and see what happens. You know, it's you have to approach life experimentally. You have to be, uh, you know, a scientist in that sense. If you feel like it helps or doesn't help, you just deal with that the best way you can. So no, I, I won't say, oh yeah, the fluoride will do this, and you know, I don't know whether that has an effect or not. Well, we get fluoride in our water, right? And that's one of the issues. You know. For as long as I can remember, I drink water out of a bottle that, you know, I buy from a company. It comes in two and a half gallon and five gallon jugs. But does it have fluoride in it? Probably some. It's a mineral that's in the earth that water perks through the earth. This water I drink comes out of a deep uh, aquifer, you know, somewhere in Arkansas where there's lots and lots of vacant space and very little industry. So. Sure, it's called a mineral water. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. I expect it has some of that in it. Huh? Where can we get your water? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I buy it from a local uh, company. It comes in a truck in a, in a big uh, glass bottle. You know, that's, so I've done that. That was so, because we had a lot of chlorine. We had a lot of chlorine in our water. Our water comes from a river. So, and the river is upstream of several large cities. So, you know, our water has a lot of junk in it. So basically, we then drink the river water. They do a pretty good job of scrubbing it, and I'm sure it meets all the health you know, standards and whatever, but uh, the bottled water actually tastes better, and uh, I like it better. So that's what I do, but it's not because I'm worried about my glands calcifying, if, if indeed that happens. I have no idea that any of that happens, but it's hard to tell. There's lots and lots of that kind of stuff around Lots of conspiracy theories about all kinds of things that'll happen to you. And mostly I'd say take them with a grain of salt because true or not, you can, you can overcome them. It doesn't really matter so much. If you think, you know, there is, a, there is a placebo effect here as well. If you think that drinking the water calcifies your gland and you, makes it difficult for you to, you know, function in the, in the bigger reality, you will probably create that situation because you're thinking about it. If you think that, oh, it doesn't have any effect on me, it probably won't because you recreate yourself and your abilities with your intent in a larger reality all the time. So it depends on you more than it depends really on what's in the water. Because even if the water is fairly toxic, if you are fairly well grown up and won't accept those toxins or deal with them, you'll slough them off or they'll disappear or they just won't affect you. You yes. see, you can, you can go, you know, you can basically beat the system that way, is what I'm saying. So mostly it, it has to do with, with you and what you think and how you approach it. If that's a fear you have, it may be a problem for you. But then I deal, I think it's better to deal with the fear and if drinking 
bottled water. If you, have, if you can get bottled water that doesn't have fluorine in it, then maybe that will reduce that fear. Now, whether that actually helps or not isn't the point. If it reduces your fear, it's probably a good thing to do. If you otherwise can't reduce that fear, again, it's a tool. It's not necessarily that, that uh, reducing the, the fluoride is actually going to have the effect that you think in a, in a um, mechanistic way as it is reducing the fluoride in your water may help you deal with the fear so that it doesn't affect you. So, yeah. It's not a simple answer. It's, it's an individual answer. So it's not like, well, everybody needs to do it this way. You see, it's not like that. Everybody can, can deal with the problem in their, own, in their own way. But I don't think that, um, you know, here's an example. Uh, you know, Bob Monroe's a real good example. You know, we talk about, well, you shouldn't eat sugar and it messes up with your consciousness. You, you know, caffeine, nicotine, all those things are bad for you. You know, the fluoridation and the what? Well, Bob Monroe smoked, <laughs> ate donuts preferably to anything else, <laughs> was, a, was a junk food junkie. He uh, was overweight. He never, he, he never exercised. Drove fast. He loved real big greasy cheeseburgers. He did everything wrong, right? And uh, the water he drank was, he lived on a farm, so it was probably well water, which generally is, has a lot of minerals in it because it perks down through a lot of rock. So it probably had every, you know, element in it that there is to some extent. It, was a, it wasn't a purified water and he didn't drink, you know, ionized whatever he just he just lived the life in his you know in his farmhouse and uh, he had he had you know he had lots of animals wandering around in his house all the time um, some of them had some of them had worms most of the time some of them didn't he didn't really you know it was all fine you know if you walk into Bob's house and stayed there a while you probably would want to go put on a biohazard suit you know? <laughs> he, he was not uh, he was just relaxed in his environment and he enjoyed his environment and he interacted with it very positively he didn't have any sense of oh this will make me ill or this isn't good for me or whatever he just did it and guess what none of it affected him at all <laughs> didn't matter that he smoked, ate donuts, did anything else. His mind was clear, he was focused, he knew what he was doing, and it just had no effect because he didn't let it have any effect. You see, that's the, you know, so, so that's the other thing. him too because he could get out of, you know, his body any time he wanted, practically. Oh yeah, he was, uh, he was very uh, able to interact with the larger consciousness system and he did all this sort of stuff. He had several, I don't know how many, two or three, maybe four. He had several of the uh, bypass surgeries, yeah. you know, oh, the, you know, where they have to unclog the arteries and go around them and that kind of stuff. He still ate the donuts, he still ate the pretzels, he smoked, you know. He didn't really pay much attention to any of those things and he lived to a reasonably old age and was very, uh, you know, very able not only in the larger reality, but in the physical reality. He never was low energy. He didn't have a hard time getting around. He was, he was very capable in all ways. So it doesn't, you know, I give that, and I, I've kind of exaggerated to the point that you didn't need a biohazard suit. You know? <laughs> it was, I'm just trying to say that, you know, he, was, he lived just very naturally and openly, and he didn't worry a whole lot about those kinds of details, and he was fine with it. Again, he didn't allow it to affect him. So, if you have fear about it, you will allow it to affect you. That's what the fear does. It connects you to it, so you allow it to affect you. So should you worry about that and get different kinds of water? Well, it depends on you. See, it's a personal question more than it is a, a question that the same answer fits everybody. Yes and no. You know, it may bother you, it may not. But it has more to do with you than it has to do with the fluorine. I had uh, two questions. I'll try to make them brief. The first one um, concerns an experience I had on September 11th, 2001. I was um, in a subway car underground 
five or six miles away from lower Manhattan on the morning of September 11th, something I had done many, many times before, and I was just standing there holding on to the rail, and all of a sudden I had this vision. It just came upon me like that, and I saw myself surrounded by what, what I knew to be dead people or ghosts, and I could see vividly around me these images of dead people, and it lasted for a couple of seconds, and it went away. And then I was looking around the car, it looked perfectly normal. I didn't know what to make of this. We were underground, there was no TV, no radio, no cell phone uh, reception, and it seemed like a perfectly normal day. And then I put it out of my mind and you know, got out in lower Manhattan where my job was and went to work and uh, I discovered soon enough what that was about. But it was um, a, a very vivid experience and uh, I was wondering if you could please comment upon the, the mechanics, if you will, of that and what it, uh, it says about the larger consciousness system. Okay. There was you know, obviously that was a kind of a, a major historical event in the making, right? And did you have this vision before any of it happened? Or during or after or what was the what was the timing of it? Uh, later I figured out that I had this about the time the first plane crashed into the yeah. tower. Okay, so that was the that was kind of the the kickoff to this key event then. You could have had it, you know, the day before would have you know, may have worked too. The, the, you know, we talk about energy again. Energy is a metaphor, right? But the energy surrounding that event, energy being something that uh, is, a, is a metaphor for something that affects something else. Okay? The probable reality of that event, because that event had been planned and had been practiced and so on. So there was a, there was a probable reality of that event, and there was a probable reality of what would follow afterwards, you know, the impact of that event. Okay. That something that um, significant, that meaningful, that much would affect you know, lots of people, lots of places, makes it a very strong signal to get. It makes it a very strong, um, very likely that you get that in your, in your data stream. So what happened is you got the information. Why you? Because you have probably been meditating, you probably are aware of the larger consciousness system, you're open to the idea, so you're someone who is open to where that would be something you could get, whereas somebody who's completely closed any of that wouldn't have gotten any of that. Also, it may have meant something to you, it may have been something that opened up your mind and said, wow, the re reality's got to be larger than it seems because, look, I got this just when it happens. How did that work? And maybe started you off on a path of wanting to dig in more and find out more about things. So part of it may have been that you, the reason you got it was because you could use it. It was something that might have been valuable to you and your own growth to have that experience as opposed to somebody who just would have put it out of their mind or said, oh, as a coincidence or, you know, whatever, and, and uh, refused to or buried it once they found out and realized that it happened and they might just deny it. You see, you were open enough to get something out of the experience. So the answer to why did it happen to you is probably because you could benefit from it. Why did you get that? Because it obviously was a big event, therefore was a, a major thing that would be hard to miss, right? It wasn't subtle. Why did you see suddenly all the dead people? Because you got data that gave you a sense of what was going to happen. The dead people weren't dead people. The dead people were a metaphor for the death and destruction that was about to happen or that was happening at that time. Many times people will get little paranormal um, experiences that mean a lot to them personally and the point of them is usually just to either wake them up some to say reality is bigger than you think, or to give them some verification that it really is that way, you know, because they're not quite sure. Well, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe they're open-minded, but they're very 
reticent to come to any conclusions of whether it's real or not real. So they have a, an event that answers that question for them. You know, there's no way you can have the experience that you had without coming to the conclusion that reality is bigger than just the, the physical, because there was no physical process to make that happen. So it's beyond physical process. So there you go. You know, that's somebody with a, a left brain uh, works logical process can't escape that. So that's the point of, of having it, but that happens to lots of people, not, not just that. Well, that did, because that was such a dramatic event that it was used in thousands of people that day, sometimes the day before, whatever, leading up to that event. There were thousands and thousands of people that got some premonition of that because it was such a dramatic physical event. You know, talk about needing some evidence, right? Well, that's, that's one that's hard to... It's not subtle. That's evidence with a sledgehammer. So that's why those kinds of things happen. That's kind of the mechanics of it. So the larger consciousness system basically puts that out. The probability is high. The impact is high. It makes it something that's, that's uh, a very dramatic experience. There's a lot of people who, are, who could gain something, help them along their path, help them in their evolution by having that kind of, you know, some sort of experience like that. This was just a, a very ripe, you know, kind of pregnant situation that, uh, that like thousands of people did get a similar kind of thing. Not in the subway, but, you know, something related to that. I've talked to four or five, six people that had some profound experience with, you know, with that happening. So that's why it was, uh, something for you, something for you to help you on your, on your path, help you understand. You know, you can do all these, you can think about this stuff intellectually and we can understand, yes, there's a larger reality and there's data streams and we, you can have all that, but until you have a personal experience, it's not really real. It's hypothetical. So the real experience to where you have it, and that, you know, you could tell people that, but it won't make any difference to them. You know, you could tell a hundred people that, you could publish that, you know, as a story, and people read it, and eh, that's nice, strange things happen all the time, but it would all stay in their intellect. But as you can attest, when it happens to you, it's different. You can't deny it. It's real, and, and it changes you. And that's, that was kind of why. So it's just the process, the way the larger consciousness system helps wake us up. It does that all over. Not only do you have these kinds of things going on, but something I talked about uh, with Adam earlier. Look at uh, things like uh, crop circles, okay? Crop circles is, a, is a, uh, an event where over in England and some other places in the world, you know, they get intricate patterns in crops, right? And the people who study it and go out in the field are generally kind of convinced that it's not that Teenagers are out in the field, you know, you know, stomping on on wheat or something. They they are convinced that they can't explain it. Okay, well, it's obviously if you have a, I shouldn't say it's obviously, but from a from a um, belief that physical process is all there is. That's the only way things happen. If somebody does something, well, then if human beings aren't doing it because that's impossible, it happens too quickly, the patterns are too intricate, no sounds are made, you know, nobody hears anything, you know, how, you know, so it's like, a eh, bunch of people aren't there out there running around because they would be noticed, they would be heard, uh, they can't do it that fast in the dark, that accurately with this detail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then if human beings aren't doing it, then somebody else must be doing it, right? Because we believe in physical process. So who's the somebody else that isn't a human being? Well, it's, it's an alien, right, is doing this for some reason. It's the ETs that have come here and must be doing it. Well, that's just because you have a belief, or the people have a belief, that it must be physical process. You see? That's just a belief. If you don't have that belief, then it seems a more obvious solution is that the larger consciousness system is doing it. Why? the same reason that you got that message. It helps open people's minds because they realize 
physical process alone can't describe, can't answer this question, just like it couldn't answer where did your data come from. Physical process isn't, isn't a good answer, doesn't fit. It wasn't that, something else. Well, that is a mind opener. Okay, it's a mind opener. Suddenly, reality is bigger than just this physical reality. Well, you can, you can kind of get that idea, that same idea in, this is like a larger scale visual version of what yours was an individual audio version. You see, it's that same sort of thing. So there's a lot of things that the larger consciousness system does, sometimes with groups of people, sometimes with individuals, but it's mainly individuals who are ready for the information. People who are not ready for the information don't get it. So if you're ready for the information that this physical reality is not all there is, you know, just what we know about it, there's things going on we don't know, then uh, you're liable to get pulled into that. You're liable to get interested in it. You're liable to see a thing on, on crop circles on your you know, on YouTube someplace and it pulls in your attention and then maybe you'll read some research on it or maybe you'll go there. If you're not and that's not in your belief system, you're not ready for that, you can't deal with that kind of concepts, then you hear the information, you discount it, you throw it away. It's not useful. Just like if you told other people about it, it wouldn't have any effect on them. They'd say, oh yeah, he just made that up, you know, it's hallucination. Uh, he thought, he remembered that, but it wasn't really true. He heard other people doing it and he did it too. And, you know, they come up with all kinds of explanations of why it wasn't real. But that's because it's not real to them, they can't accept that. So it doesn't happen to them. So that sort of thing's very widespread in many ways. And, and a lot of it is called synchronicity, where these things just happen to happen at the right time. You know, you just get, you walk in the library and, and some book just immediately grabs your attention. You pull it off and you read that book and it changes your life. You know, it gives you a whole new insight on things. These are, that's synchronicity. How does that happen? You're being nudged by the larger consciousness system. Why would the larger consciousness system do that? Well, we are a part of its strategy to evolve. As we evolve, it evolves because we're it. It's us. We're part of consciousness. So as we evolve, it evolves. It wants us to succeed. It created this nice virtual reality to give us an interactive playground in order to grow up in. So why would it just stand back and not help the students learn? So that's, that's really what it's about. It's about the larger consciousness system helping the students learn and you get these experiences. That's kind of the mechanics of it. Now as far as the, the details of the mechanics, well, it's just putting data in your data stream. That's all, it's a simple thing to do. Just add, add that information to your, in, everybody has an individual personal data stream. And uh, it just adds data into your data stream because you could use it. I had, I had this that. little dog and so I went to the hospital like six weeks ago and my husband went out to smoke a cigarette and he didn't know the door was a little open. So she ran out and got hit by a car. Mm -hmm and she died. So when I got back, I found out that she died. So I was like crying, then I went to bed. The dog came to me and it was black and white. And he kept calling me, calling me. So I got up, I'm like, I keep, I, I, I can hear her. But when I open my eyes, she's not there. But if I close my eyes, she's coming to me as black and white, but it's brown and white mm -hmm. when she died. When, you know, the dog I had is brown and white but it's coming into as black and white, black and white. Then three weeks later, this little kitten on Sunday was crying so hard on, on near our window, bedroom window. So I'm like, you know what, I really don't, I, I was telling my husband, I said, it looks like there's a stray that had like litter. Mm -hmm. And then he continuously crying and crying, it wouldn't stop. So he decided to go outside. Mm -hmm. And when he went outside, the, the kitten walked towards him and it's black and white, mm -hmm. kitten. And they never walk towards people, the stray ones. If you, if you go close to them, they run. So he just walked towards him and he ran into the house and he said, honey, you have to see this. 
because I was getting ready to go to church. He's like, you have to see this. I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I'm, I'm late. He's like, no, no, come out. So I, walk, I walked outside. The kitten walked past him and walked towards me. I'm like, oh my gosh, is, is it possible that the spirit, because my dog goes to that to that, the yard mm -hmm. and runs a lot. And he plays a, she plays a lot in the door, in the yard. Do you think it is possible that the dream I had, that my, the spirit of my dog, I mean, it sounds kind of weird, Mm -hmm. Because everything that my dog does, that kitten does, and it's kind of weird. Sometimes he spooks me. Mm -hmm. So is that possible? Sure. <laughs> sure that's possible. That there's, you know, and there's many ways that you can look at it. You can look at it in a very simplistic way, is that the, you know, the dog, dogs are conscious. Cats are conscious, you know, so are squirrels and and, uh, you know, lots of things are conscious. If it's conscious, then it's a player. It's a player in this game just like we are, okay? So it can incarnate just like we do. And um, so yes, in the, in the most simplistic sense, you could say that the spirit of the dog comes back in the kitten and you were given the information to make it so that it connected with you when that happened. But on a more complicated and in a, in a, a bigger picture, it doesn't have to be that mechanistic. We don't have to say we get the spirit, we take it here, and then we put it over there in a different body and so on. We can just say that reality adjusted itself to meet your needs. And it gave you the information you needed so that you could connect to what was going on. You know, if you hadn't had those images of your dog and one, it was black and white rather than brown and white, you may, maybe wouldn't have made the connection to the cat. But that was probably a good thing for you. It was probably something you needed. It's probably something that was significant. And it also maybe would open your mind to the fact that there's a larger reality out there that uh, isn't as down as maybe you thought. So it's the same sort of thing. It um, was, an, uh, was an event, a mind opener. Reality is bigger. And it's just not that hard for the larger consciousness system to do those kinds of tricks, right? It's got all the information. It's the one that creates the data stream. It's the one that creates, you know, the reality ha we have here. It can, it can certainly do that. Yeah, it can certain. You know, it can do all kinds of those sorts of things, and it will do them if it's profitable. I suspect that that was a profitable experience for you. I think it helped me because I couldn't. My husband was like kind of worried about me. I was crying a lot. I, I can't just understand why. I can't get over it. I keep. It was like in the place so, of my mind over and over. Mm -hmm. Like, what if I did this? Because I was gonna take her with me, and my husband decided to stay home. So I, he, I said, okay, if you're staying home that mm -hmm. day, just you know, stay with her. So it met, it met some of your needs. It also was a was kind of an eye opener and a mind opener. So it was a very positive thing to do. The system is like that. Sometimes the system is like that in a very kind way, like it happened with you. Sometimes the system wraps us right between the eyes with a hard object to get our attention. And we think it's, you know, it's in a, a mean way, but it's not mean at all. It's all opportunity. So this was an opportunity for you to get a bigger picture. And, and op, you know, sometimes pain is a good teacher as well. All these things happen. It's just the kind of reality we live in. And when you live in a virtual reality, it's not this objective causality that we have to, you know, make everything, have a reason for everything. It happens because it's good to happen. So yes, it's what you are feeling and thinking and wondering about is entirely possible. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Without <clears throat> any culture or ego or, uh, I guess, identity, is there any fundamental difference between men and women as a, at a consciousness level, or is it a strictly PMR concept? No, there are, there are fundamental differences. If you take away all the cultural things and take away the, the overlays, right, the, uh, the ego and fear and all that kind of stuff, there's still fundamental differences between male and female. They're not just the same, you know, we give trucks to little boys and dolls to little girls and then that makes them act different. It's not like that. They're not, uh, they're not just different by the experiences that they have or the culture that they live in. That culture obviously has an effect, 
I mean, we're all acculturated and have belief systems and, and uh, attitudes that come from our culture, but fundamentally different, which is, the difference is terrific, right? The difference is such that we, what could we say, we help each other, male and female. We help each other grow. You will probably find that you will not have a teacher that will help you lose ego any better than a girlfriend and a wife, and vice versa. No teacher will probably, you will learn more from than you will from your significant other. Okay? And that would be true even in, in a same-sex relationship. It's, it's from the, it's from the uh, close relationships that we have is where we also get our greatest challenges. That's the greatest challenges that we have because they affect us at a very deep level. And the sort of things that um, you will learn with your significant other, with a female, you're not going to learn any other way. So we're very necessary for each other. We, we are a, you know, a very uh, well-designed and compatible set, even though we, we see it as incompatibilities. You know, those are not incompatibilities. Those are challenges to grow up. And uh, yes, there are fundamental, fundamental differences. Now, if you get into the, you know, well, which is better and which is, you know, it's nothing like that. It's not that there's better, best, just difference. But the difference is very profitable for us in our relationships. So yeah, there are fundamental differences. Just to follow up with that, could one of you define what you mean by men and women? Like, do you mean like sexual parts? Or do you mean gender? Because, you know, gender varies across culture. You could look sure. one way, but be considered male because, you know what I mean? I just, I'm, I'm just curious yeah, it's, it's separate that from culture. Well, you know, it, it gets, because there's, there's, you know, physiology, right, is the, is the basis. So we have this, this virtual reality, and we have these, we have evolution in this virtual reality system. So I guess we'll start with like the big digital bangs when they turned on the computer, and we, everything expanded, and so on. We got a universe, eventually you get a planet, and you get a sun, and a one-celled thing becomes a money-celled thing. So we end up now with species in male and female. So that's the virtual reality, and that's, that's what happened in the computer. That's a simulation, and that's what produces the constraints on us. So why did you end up then with male and female of most species? Of course, some species are asexual and don't have male or female, but most, they, they work out those issues their own way, right? They, uh, but anyway, why did you have that? because that's the way it evolved. Okay, it evolved that way because it did. Evolution is an open-ended thing that just happens. Okay, it was an efficient process in this evolution given the environment that it was in. So we have male and female. So it's, it's fundamental to the rule set that we, have fun, that we have male and female. The basic rule set that evolved us and evolved our whole universe created it the way it created it. Does that mean it has to always create it the same way? No, it's just the way it evolved. It's the way it happened to evolve here. So now, what is this male and female? But now that you have, have a male and female in physiology and biology, you know that a lot of biology is sort of random. The way all those chromosomes go together is kind of random. The way they express themselves. That's why, you know, People don't all look alike, right? And they all, you know, they're different because of the way that all the randomness that's in the system. Well, the same thing happens, obviously, with our sexuality. So now, instead of you just have males and females, you have a whole smattering of individuals that are almost a continuum from one end to the other. We have, you know, degrees of femininity and masculinity, if you will, and femininity and masculinity have very strong cultural definitions to them. But we have gradations just in biology from male and female and things that are part of both, right, in the middle. And sometimes things that are kind of physically one way, but, you know, mentally, emotionally, physiologically in the cells a different way. So it's all a very confused thing because biology is very 
random. It's got a lot of random components in it. Okay, so what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about male and female, I'm not, I'm not trying to um, be precise about all the various continuum that can get very, you know, almost unidentifiable as one sex or another, right? So I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about this end versus that end, the two extremes, male and female. And those two beings that have evolved to be male and female are not just carbon copies of each other with different parts. They're not just carbon copies of each other with different cultures. They're fundamentally different in the way they process information, the way they interpret information, the metaphors they use, what's important to them and what's not. What, uh, you know, their realities are different. They see the world in a different light. And that's not because one of them got a truck and one of them got a doll to play with. It's because they just fundamentally are different. And why? Because it worked in the evolution. It was something, it was a process that was successful. That's the way evolution works. If a process develops something that's successful, it continues and builds on itself. That's the way fractals work as well. If the process of evolution produces something that doesn't work well, it goes away, it dies off, becomes extinct. So you end up with a physical reality that's basically evolved to work, to be successful. And uh, like I said before, it is very profitable for us to be different, to have different viewpoints, different realities, different ways of looking at the world because if everybody looked at the world in the same way, growth would be very difficult. It would be such sameness that what would challenge you? What would pull you to change? What would, uh, you know, help you uh, see things in different ways, open your mind, have a bigger perspective? It wouldn't work out very well. We wouldn't be a very successful species doing what we're supposed to do. And remember, what we're supposed to do here isn't just survive and multiply. That's kind of the, the stress of the, of the, of the uh, evolution, physical evolution. But the point of us being here, of course, is to grow up, become, enlarge our perspective, get a bigger picture. And you can't do that with sameness. It doesn't work very well. It's not a, you know, it's, it's not so viable. So we need, uh, we need each other to challenge each other. And uh, this is the one over here in the purple shirt who talks. That's, my, that's the one, if you've read the books. She's, uh, that's Pamela. And uh, she is my strongest, best, and, and uh, most effective teacher, and always has been. She can challenge me as no one else can. She can find ego like nobody else <laughs> can find it. You see? So that's wonderful for me. See, I'm very lucky to have such a great teacher. So that's the way, that's the way it works. You have to have a good relationship. You have to give. It has to be about other. Love is about other, right? It's not about yourself. And if love is about other, then learning to love is learning to give. So that's the, you know, relationship is the key teacher there. And even when we go to work, we have relationships with the people we work with. We have relationships with our neighbors. We have relationships with all kinds of people. And we learn from all those relationships. Sometimes the boss at work really aggravates us, you know, gets our ego peaked up. But there's nothing like a significant other to help you grow up. So, and it works obviously both ways, you know, it's, it helps, the, you know, the male aspect of reality helps the female grow up as well as the other way around. It works entirely both ways. So we're very uh, good for each other in that way. That doesn't mean we always smile and are happy and relationships don't have their pain and, and hard parts. It just means those pain and hard parts are lessons, they're challengers. If we can meet those, if we can grow up and get rid of the ego and fear, then the relationship is wonderful. You know, it's, it's beautiful, it's terrific. If we can't, then we struggle and we fight and we fuss and we create all of that problem in ourselves.
we create it for ourselves because it's not about other, it's about us. Oh, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I need. You see, it's all about I. Where if it's not about you, if it's just about you giving the other person what they want and what they need, how could you be unhappy? You see, you're only unhappy when you are not getting what you want. So unhappiness is derivative of an ego. You grow out of your ego and you're happy. Life is terrific. You see, well, what better juxtaposition and learning in life could you have in that you get rid of your ego and you instantly get rewards. You're happy. Everything works great. You have an ego and you're miserable because you can't make the other person or your boss or anybody else be the way you want them to be, which of course is the right way to be. You can't make them right. You know, they, they just have problems. It's their ego is the problem and it's because they're not giving me what I need and what I want the way I need it and want it. Well, it's not their ego that's the problem. They indeed may have an ego. They may indeed have fear, but that's not what makes you unhappy. What makes you unhappy is your own ego and fear. You not getting what you want. So you see, it's a really great situation in this learning lab, you know, with the males and the females and relationships and all the things we do. It's just about as optimum a situation as you could have for beings to interact with each other to help each other grow up. It's, the hard part is seeing that it's actually that way. The hard part is seeing that your misery is self-created. We always blame, you know, if we're miserable, it's somebody else's fault. You know, somebody else is in charge of making us happy, you know, it's that sort of thing. And until we get over that, then our life is generally very problematic. Once we get over that, everything gets better in a hurry.